Welcome to the Retrospect Podcast, a show where people come together from different walks of life to discuss a topic from their generation's perspective. My name is Ian, and as always, I'm joined by Jason. Hello, everyone. And Stoney. Hello. Okay. There you go. It's a big day. Big day. Got a guest guest in the studio today, um, veteran uh, political uh, analyst Jim Ingster. Wow. Thank you for driving all the way out here to the show. (laughs) (laughs) My honor. It's great to be on your fabulous show. We had a conversation, and that's what our show really is. It's just a big conversation a while back, and we were talking about the election and just things, how it works, and and Ian went, wow, that would be a great show to have. It's just talking about politics and how the election works in the country and things like that, and I said, oh, wait, I think I know somebody (laughs) that may be great, and um, so I, I reached out to you and just was so honored when you said you would come on. So you feel like talking about the election well, a little I'm, bit and some politics? I'm, I'm good talking with you, and uh, I know I'm in good hands, and I appreciate your commitment to making our world better. That's it. Mm. That's us. There's a. I know that it's a, a big year this year with you know the election happening, and that was why that's what kind of sparked what he was talking about. Was there's a lot of stuff that there's a lot of terminology, there's a lot of words, there's a lot of um, things that I don't feel like people specifically in my age bracket and maybe younger that are now, you know, voting age now that I don't think fully understand or can wrap their head around a little bit. And like I said, I know it's it, we got a handful of months until things start getting real. It's going to get uh, really real. And mm-hmm. like, and so like, and that's what I'm, I, when I had was talking about it with, with these guys, it was, uh, you know, how can we spread awareness a little bit? How can we talk about it? How can we make it feel less like it's this kind of otherworldly thing and make it a little bit more understandable? What is some of your background that you have kind of uh, been? Well, I've been covering elections since 1979. <laughs> okay. I was a student at LSU. And back in the day, Louisiana elections generated uh, more interest than presidential elections. Yes. That has changed a lot. About twice as many people voted in the presidential election in Louisiana in 2020 as voted in the 2023 governor's election. Really? Well, and we only had about 35% of the voters cast ballots uh, on October 14th. So we're more ginned up about the presidential election. And, and some would say, why? Because uh, often local politics affect people more than national. Mm. And in Louisiana, it's, it's a given that uh, the Republican candidate will, until things change, will win the presidential election in Louisiana, meaning... The Republican will get all the electoral votes. Mm-hmm. Bill Clinton was the last uh, Democrat to win. He did win here in 92 and 96, but no Democrat since. And Donald Trump, if he's breathing, will win Louisiana's mm-hmm. eight electoral votes in November. So why do we vote? Uh, we vote because uh, we either like somebody or don't like them. And, and Trump is one of those polarizing figures like David Duke. That was the last time we really had a heavy turnout in a governor's election. That was 1991. About 80% of the electorate cast ballots then. And uh, obviously in that case, it was a large anti-Duke vote. But in Louisiana, it's more uh, of a case in which people, more people like Trump than don't. And it's largely uh, based uh, in our state somewhat like it is in Mississippi, in which about Oh, 85% of the white people in 2020 voted for Trump and 95% of the black people voted for Biden. Hmm. Right now, there are more white people than black people in Louisiana. So that means that the person who has um, more white votes is more likely to win. And Trump won going away. He won by 400,000 votes in Louisiana. He lost by 7 million nationally, but he won by 400,000 here as he did in 2016. So we are a member of the Southeastern Conference. There are 12 states in the Southeastern Conference, and those 12 states have 160 electoral votes. And in two elections, Donald Trump's 23-1 and one in the SEC. Mm-hmm. So you start, as he likely will, and I think this time he's, he's more than likely to carry Georgia, which he lost narrowly last time. He'll have 160 electoral votes right from the start. Mm-hmm. And you only need 270 to win. So that shows you the might of this region. And when it monolithically votes one way, it can make a huge difference in the election. Mm. 
What? Why, oh, yeah. why do you think that uh, former President Trump, why, why, what, what has made him this polarizing figure? Because, I mean, we all knew Donald Trump before even <laughs> the, the, the whole yeah. thing with the whole presidential thing started. I mean, what, I mean, from my understanding, he was pretty much ran around in Democratic circles back in the day. And so mm-hmm. what, what, what's changed? I mean, what? Well, what, he's actually won multiple awards. And shook hands and stood there with Jesse Jackson, Al yeah, Sharpton, yeah, and he's won what, multiple awards from the NAACP. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand all the all the criticisms I've I've heard about him, and I'm I'm sitting there going, well, none of these things really never came up before. Now, of course, he didn't run for public office, and of course, well, he did, running he, for public he office, did, he as didn't run ten- against Hillary Clinton, and as soon as yeah. he ran against her, well, I mean, then well, they started. I mean, I, well, maybe so. I mean, well. He ran against her as an opponent, but mm-hmm. it, there seems to be, it's kind of like going up 10 levels of hate, the people who dislike him. It, it's almost to a point now, I look at him going, it's like people are losing sleep over this stuff. And it's like, why do you think he generates that kind of reaction in people? I mean, I, I don't I don't understand that, but what 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 is your looking at this from a more holistic standpoint what why does he rea- he generates the reaction that he does he uh, as you stated never ran for office but he was a democrat and i think he's an opportunist and he's uh, played his cards really well and and politics is all about timing and he came along at a time when country was ready for him and and the media and i'm talking about all media whether it's conservative liberal or balanced uh, they followed his every move and gave him a lot of free publicity and he says outrageous things and he's conducted his life in a way that um, most americans would not or could not and and i think from his followers who are just as passionate as his detractors that's why they like him they'd like to live his life most men in america and we're talking white men would love to have a, a billion dollars and lots of women and uh, be accountable to nobody and live their life on their own terms and not have to pay the price and of doing that. And most of us, if we try doing that, we don't go very far and we might end up, <laughs> we might end up on the wrong side of the law, but for Trump it's worked. And until now, and it may, it may continue to work for him. He may very well be elected. Uh, his, his detractors, uh, I'm sure resent his success and flaunting, uh, rules that are in place uh, that are either stated or not. Uh, I remember in 1987, a year before the presidential election of 88, um, Gary Hart was the favorite. And he got caught with uh, a woman who was not his wife on a boat in Bimini called the monkey business. And that was the end of Gary Hart. But Donald Trump, any allegation uh, seems to be met with... um, even more support from his followers <laughs> and, and more disdain from his detractors. And we live in a divided country, and Trump seems to be the dividing line. When I was a little kid, and I'm a little older than anyone in this room, I remember when I was, let's see, six years old, then Cassius Clay won the heavyweight championship of the world, and he probably, er, he, uh, uh, ultimately, just a few months later, became Muhammad Ali. He refused uh, to be inducted in the draft and serve in the war. And of course they weren't going after other athletic heroes at that time. You didn't see Jack Nicholas being drafted Mm. or Joe Namath or Pete Maravich go down the list, but Muhammad Ali was, and he refused to go. And, and, and uh, you could usually tell a whole lot about somebody by just asking them what they thought of Muhammad Ali about their belief system. And I think today we have the same thing with Trump. Uh, when when somebody says they like Trump, we know pretty much uh, what they stand for. And when they say they mm-hmm. don't like Trump a lot, we pretty much know what they stand for. So he is a polarizing figure, and in one way he has conquered the world because I do think most Americans every day think of him several times a day. He, <laughs> he's, in, he's in everybody's mind, <laughs> and in that case, uh, he is possibly the most 
infamous or famous, depending on how you look at it, person in the history of our country. There are more people, and most of the people in this country think about him on a regular basis. Some are obsessed with him on both sides. I know people in this community where we live who their pastime, and these are people who are business people. They're not uh, nuts, but uh, they travel around the country to Trump rallies. That's their that's their pastime. That's really? what that's what gets them going. It's kind of like going to the Bahamas or wow or to Rio de Janeiro. It's going I've never. I, the, it's interesting that you, the, you framed it in the way you, you did because I I feel like I've subconsciously knew that, but I've never really thought about it like that. Of like you can really gauge somebody. Um by that sort of if someone's like oh i'm vehemently against him or i'm i'm super on board with him like okay i kind of know where to gauge my how to how to conversate or handle you in a way of like you know what should i stay away from what should i talk about and those kind of things and like i've never really thought about it like that but it's very true if not just for you know him being president other aspects of my life or like as a musician and an artist if you feel very strongly against something i'm like okay cool i know where where to kind of place you in my head, at least, you know, what are, what are we going to probably agree on? What are we going to disagree on? That sort of stuff, which is interesting. And uh, I, I hear the same thing about Trump that I heard about Duke 30 or so years ago. People will say, I don't like him, but I like his politics. Yeah. Which usually means I like him a whole lot. <laughs> and, and Duke uh, would under poll meaning more people would actually be for him on election day than it showed in polls. And there's some of that in Trump too. So the fact that Trump is leading and as we speak, we're 30 weeks from an election, uh, he's leading, he's under indictment in four places. And, uh, Oh, that's only because the judicial system won't indict the president Biden crime family. Is that what you think? Yes, I absolutely do. Well, I I, I would disagree with you there. Mm -hmm. They've had every opportunity to do it. Uh, Well, he's weaponized them against the conservatives. Well, many of those people, Stoney, were put in place by Trump. Many of the prosecutors are Republicans. Some. Some. But if you look at the the liberals, what they're doing is is they're having sex with with each other. Well, Donald Trump had sex with a porn star. Okay. Yes, he did. Because he also has a letter that she says the affair didn't happen, and that just came out last week. Well, he paid her $130,000 to write that letter. Actually, he didn't pay that money. A a gentleman representing Mm -hmm. Bill Barr. It was Michael Cohen. Yes, Cohen. Who was working for Donald Mm -hmm. Trump. Now, why would a guy who wrote Art of the Deal pay $130,000 to somebody to deny something that n- never happened. That seems like the art hush, of the steel to me. Hush money happens a lot on well, both Donald sides Trump, of that ticket. Donald Trump was a lot. wimp to do that. Mm-hmm. And you know, he's a big fat guy, too. He can't bench press his weight. He's not much of a man. He mm-hmm. talks tough, but he's really not. Well, you know, I have a question. Yes. How do political strategies in Louisiana differ from those in other key battleground states in the U.S. So could you help us define a battleground state? And as Louisiana is a battleground state, how, how, do, how do they differ from some of the other battleground states across the nation? Well, we're not a battleground state. It's a given that Trump wins Louisiana. There are only of seven I think well, do states. you think, maybe, and maybe I guess the direction I want to go with that is, is Louisiana has been uh, primarily a Republican state, but we also just elected John Bell Edwards twice, and he was one of the first, you know, double-term governors of the, you know, Democrat Party, and now we're going back to uh, Republican again. But could it be turning into a battleground state? No. Okay. No, we're not a battleground state. And uh, the Electoral College is flawed because as a result of the fact that we know Trump will win Louisiana and Trump will win Texas, and Biden will win California, and Biden will win New York. Candidates are not going to go to about 43 states unless they're there to raise money. So the only states they go to are the seven battleground states they're listing now, and that's probably right, and that's Georgia, North Carolina, and I think Trump is likely to carry those. Ohio would be another one. Not not anymore. anymore. It's a red state. That's a Trump state. Okay. Um, What about Wisconsin? Wisconsin. 
Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Nevada. Has Colorado kind of become one? Because they were, they, for years state. and years, they, yeah, they, they were. They, they were, were a conservative state, and now they're a liberal state now. Well, so would wrong. that be kind of, huh? All those people from California well, moved over there. <laughs> Changed the politics well, of that I, state. I'll tell yeah, you a true. funny story there. When I, when I lived, I lived on the western slope. And the interstate system coming from California, there was these large billboards and it said, if you're from California and you plan on staying more than three days, turn around and go back. <laughs> we don't want you here. Well, those signs are no longer there. And it's turning into a large liberal state. Which, so, uh, Colorado? Colorado, yeah, yes. Colorado's a blue state now. Mm-hmm. So there won't be much action in Colorado. No. And okay. if a candidate carries, like, if a Republican wins Colorado, a Republican's going to win. Mm-hmm. And if a Democrat wins Ohio, Democrat's going to win. Now... I was uh, talking with uh, your friend James Carville the other day on mm-hmm. the air, and, and he, he said that if uh, Biden, with uh, all of his flaws as a candidate, were to win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania and win everything else Hillary won, the Democrats would win the election. Well, th- that's not true because of the fact that there are fewer electoral votes in the states that Hillary won eight years ago than there are now. And I I did the math, and uh, actually, if that were to happen, meaning Trump would win Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, Georgia, the other battleground, and Biden wins Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, the electoral vote would be 269 to 269. Oh, wow. (laughs) Which means it would go to the House of Representatives, which means it would go to the current House, not the new House, meaning that Mm. Mike Johnson of Louisiana would likely, I would think, make Donald Trump the president President, of the United States. And uh, I'm sure that would be a prescription for unity in our country. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Is there a... We talk about unity. I hear that a lot. The fact of the matter is, can we really ever be united with the, the, the state of the world, the country... Is that utopia possible? Because I hear the word unity all the time. The, there's there's a lot of people I don't want to be unified with mm-hmm. because I radically disagree with right. their version of America versus my version of America. So how do we survive with the current projection in which we're going? Because unless something from the outside happens that kind of like changes the paradigm, so to speak. I I mean, I don't see us ever being unified in this country. I, I I just don't. We've become so entrenched in our camps and we're not really able to, 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 to kind of reach out across the aisle, so to speak and shake hands with people. I mean, our conversations, you talk about something and it's, if you disagree with me, you hate me. And there's no longer this talking that we once were able to do in this country. What changed? What happened to us as Americans? Part of it is the fact uh, the way campaigns are run and each side picks at the other side and uh, goes after uh, candidates uh, on their most vulnerable issues and uh, stuff like transgender issues that that plays well but it's really not one of the top 20 issues in america right but but it's it's an issue that plays well and um, that's an example but um we we've always been a divided country uh, to some extent. That's part of the way in a free society with two major parties, the way things work. And after all, in 1804, not far after the Revolutionary War, the Vice President of the United States shot and killed the Secretary of the Treasury in a duel. So we've always been divided. We had a civil war, but but one thing that has changed, which I do find alarming, is that. Unlike uh, America in World War II, when we united and went to war, and collectively we were all together for one purpose, I don't know that we can do that now uh, and I, I, if we were attacked. Uh, we, we united, I thought, uh, after 9-11, but 
today, if, um, if you're for Biden, you wouldn't want to fight for Trump. And if you're for Trump, you wouldn't want to fight for Biden. And part of that is of their doing. Uh, Biden got out of Vietnam with a doctor's excuse, fake asthma. Trump got out of Vietnam with a doctor's excuse, fake bone spurs. And yet they are running for an office and have both won the office in which um, they have the moral authority, they say, to send Americans, men and women, off to fight wars of which they would not fight. They proved Mm. it. And so every day when they look in the mirror, they see a coward, the coward who wouldn't serve when it was their time. And from my point of view, it would be better to have somebody who didn't make the choices that they made, but that's the choice we have. And um, Americans have stated pretty eloquently they're not really, they're not in favor of that choice, but that's what we have. And we also have two really old guys. Biden it will be 82 in uh, November, and Trump wow. will be 78 in June. So collectively, they'll be 160 years old. And in 1960, and I was the only one alive at that time in this room, but I barely, but we had two World War II veterans running against each other. We had 47-year-old Richard Nixon, Mm. 43-year-old John Kennedy, and they both had fought in World War II. And they were collectively 90 years old. So we have uh, two guys who collectively will be 160 years old on Election Day. And 64 years ago, we had two guys who were 90 years old. So we're going from an average age of 45 to an average age of 80. And even though we're living longer, we're not living that much longer. And, and we, uh, we hopefully will not be in a situation where we have to storm the beaches of another country to liberate the world. But uh, we might. And I don't think we're united enough to do it. And uh, that is a problem. And most Americans want the same things. They want freedom. Uh, they want to live their lives uh, without turmoil. They want the resources to advance their lives. And despite our flaws, we have a better standard of living now than we've ever had. But we have division that is substantial, and it's palpable. And I know Democrats who hate Trump more than they hate Putin and Republicans who hate Biden more than they hate Putin. Well, Vladimir Putin's a really bad guy. We might have to go to war against him. What happens then? I'm not certain. It may not be a good thing uh, mm. as far as how our country will react to a true evil person. He makes Biden and Trump look like romper room because he is a true bad guy. Mm-hmm. But right now the country uh, is more fixated on the other side and all the demons that are involved with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party rather than trying to um, resolve matters and live as harmoniously as we can and unite on the, mo- on the important things, which I do think most Americans would be in accord with, but we, we accent things that divide us and we don't emphasize things that unite us, and that's how campaigns are run, are run and won, and, and Americans often say they dislike negative campaigning, negative advertising, but it works. Well, it's the fear factor. Campaigns yeah. use fear. That's the biggest thing that they use. I agree. Today. I agree with you. Stone. Why? So, so, I guess do you do you know potentially why the the average age has gone up? Is there just not enough younger people that are getting into running in that sort of thing, or they're not? They're not. Are they being pushed out? Or it's possible that a lot of qualified people, maybe the most qualified people, don't want any part of politics. They don't want mm. their whole lives to be on display for the masses to see. I wouldn't want mine no. <laughs> to be on display. And, and if they have families, they certainly don't want their wives and kids to hear everything they've done. And yeah. some things they haven't done or accused of doing. Uh, everything we hear is not, I'll give you, is not necessarily true. But I remember Pat Paulson, a guy who ran for president in 1968 when he was on the Smothered Brother Comedy Hour, he, on the Stag Party, by the way, the Straight Talking <laughs> American Government Party, the Stag Party. He said, rumors of the worst kind, true rumors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and most of us have things in our lives we don't want uh, the world to see. Yes, but they were before cell phones and video <laughs> capture on those cell there phones. You go, and so. now we have, and, uh, yeah, you can yeah. really be humiliated. But now, mm-hmm. now, um, like I'm sure candidates will say, look, that's not me. That's AI. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, it's, don't, I, I had don't, a, don't I, believe your lying eyes. That's I not me. Terrible accident in June of last year, and, and I have some severe memory problems 
And a couple of people asked me, well, what do you do about the memory problems? And I says, I really don't remember what happened in the 80s and, and early 90s you don't. anymore. You don't. And so I said, what I'll do is I'm thinking about running for office mm-hmm. and let everybody drag up my past, and then maybe I'll remember some of it, or at <laughs> well, least I'll know what happened. <laughs> well, if I were running... And, and just so and, you and know, I'm just so you know, Jim, there is actually a hashtag out there, Stony no, for President. No, 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 and no. I did not start that, but <laughs> okay, there is a well, hashtag, Stony for President. Yeah, I remember Barbara Streisand had a song, Stony End. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were running, everything I did before '65, and I'm '66 now, would be I would just say it was a youthful indiscretion. <laughs> 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 youthful indiscretion. So, 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 Jim, what what made you? get interested in pol i mean what kind of what was the the, the yeah, factors that yeah really you said you started this when you were back at lsu, LSU. So what, so. what yeah. got you into well, all this i i, uh, I grew up in uh, new orleans and in little rock and uh, both arkansas and louisiana are um good laboratories for politics and yes they are and, and louisiana for example we have one out of 73 people in the country but we sure generate a lot more than one out of 73 news stories so uh, so I was exposed to it at, at an early age. Um, first memory I have, it would have been when I was three years and five days old. I remember John Kennedy taking the oath of office, January 20th, 1961. And I was alive. I was five when he was killed. So uh, those things made an impression on me. And uh, I don't know that our country has recovered from what happened on November 22nd, 1963. But when I was uh, 10 years old, I was in the fifth grade. I was at St. Patrick's uh, grade school, elementary school in North Little Rock, Arkansas. And I remember I polled our student body, all of those who would answer. And, of course, we're talking small kids, one through eighth grade. But who they wanted in the 68th presidential election, and that was Nixon, Humphrey, and George Wallace. Wallace carried uh, both Arkansas and Louisiana, by the way. Nixon won the election, but Humphrey was an LSU graduate, vice president of the United States, and he lost a narrow race. And I remember it was almost dead even between the three, the three candidates. And uh, I found that fascinating that um, here we had a school, we were all white, all Catholic, all from generally the same backgrounds, and yet we had three different candidates mm. with varying degrees of distinction i mean there, there was definitely a choice nixon was much different than humphrey and wallace was much different than either one of them so uh and yet it was it was basically one third one third one third and and i i thought then well at 10 years old i had an epiphany that uh, our country is divided at least ideologically but i think at that time in 1968 we would have um, responded better to an attack on our country, but as we know, we didn't respond well to Vietnam, which, mm-hmm. which, w- that was probably the turning point. That was an ill-advised war, and uh, it it really started under Democrats, but was escalated under Nixon, a Republican, and uh, it, it was a war that uh, scarred our nation, and but it we're was, still paying the price. If I may, it was also the first televised war. Um, it hit television pretty hard. Where World War II, you actually had to go to the movie theater and see the little yeah. newsreels and stuff. But the yeah. Vietnam War was primetime TV, and and maybe, that's a, li- maybe a little bit of Korea, but sure, uh, yeah. but, 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 but but Vietnam yeah. was but most big... people didn't have a television set in right. 1952, mm-hmm. but that, they that, did in 1968, and and the war lasted all the way to 1975. That, that's kind of my next question to you: is how has the digital age altered political campaigning and voter engagement in Louisiana? Everybody's a journalist now, and um, on on. Things like this, we, we can say things, and largely it's unabated now. Mm-hmm. I think the people here are presenting things honestly and forthrightly and, and maybe saying things they wouldn't say in conventional media, and that's why these kinds of programs are good. But um, You're talking about the podcast? Yeah. Because okay. yeah, yeah. you said something earlier about AI, and I, I was kind of ready for my question. Well, AI, again, yeah, AI, you can, you can alter. We could mm-hmm. take things that we're saying now and change a few words and mm-hmm. make it sound like we said something Because Ian's other. a big fan of AI. No, so. well, <laughs> no, I'm not. But AI can also be used. I think it's great that we can bring John Lennon back from the grave. We can bring Elvis <laughs> Presley back from the grave. But, but, um, but 
um, I don't know. Um, How do you see that shaping the future in Louisiana? Been a good thing. Is it is it something that's going to help us I, or hurt I, us? Mostly? I don't know. It's too early to tell. Generally, I think it's good to have um, to have various means of expression and have uh, uh, media available for everyone. But when we talked about unity, I think back in the day when um, when I was a young person, and you, you people are not too far behind me. <laughs> When we would have uh, three major networks, yep. That's right. we all had a common experience because most of us watched one of those networks the night before. And if it was a really big show, like Who Shot JR, <laughs> yeah. just about everybody watched right. it. Dallas. Now, <laughs> now I, was, I was thinking of something the other day, and I was trying to think of what it was. That uh, Oh, it was the O.J. Simpson case. Mm, yeah. The, 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 the uh, Bronco chase, the Bronco. O.J. died the other day, and... And uh, he was a guy who, if he had not been a football hero, would have been a nobody. But he was a great football player, and he parlayed that into fame. And he was a good-looking guy, and he became an actor. And then he killed his wife and her friend, and he got away with it. And there was a chase. Ninety-five million people watched that. Wow. Wow. Ninety-five million. Well, the New York Times a couple of years ago had two days in a row on the front page, Tucker Carlson, and pointed out that he was the most influential person in media at that time. That's That was their opinion, and I, it probably was true. But his nightly viewership was 3 million. Mm. And 95 million, that's the, just 30 years ago, 95 million watched the O.J. Simpson Bronco Chase, which had turned out to be m- much ado about nothing, but it was great drama. But we had that common thread, like Walter Cronkite. Yep. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge numbers um, when he was anchoring the CBS News. But today we ha- we're fractured because most of us, uh, when we go home at night and then we go to work the next day, we have different experiences. We don't have that commonality where we can, well, what did you think about this or that or the other? Uh, we have to inform others of what we saw and why it meant something to us. And, uh, and, and there's nothing terribly wrong with that. But when we have a lack of unity in our country, everything that uh, is different, uh, I think, becomes a source of uh, anxiety, perhaps. And, and we don't have the cohesion as far as our common experiences we had years ago. Well, but back then it was the news that you trusted. You could trust them. You could trust Walter Conkright. Well, um, and to a certain extent, I mean, I'm sure there was still a little bit of play in there, but that's who you went to to find out the information. And now information is so readily available and sometimes it's not true. And I think more on the internet, more than not, it's not true. Um, and sometimes then think, intentionally not true. Exactly. And, and part of that is, is back when president Obama was in, um, in office, he, um, did some, what was it? The Smith Munt act or whatever that until that time, the U S government had to tell the truth and they could not use propaganda against their own people. And he overturned that, which allowed now even the government to use propaganda and not tell us the truth. And so that's even in a government, that's not just, you know, journalism. That's our own government saying, okay, we're not going to tell you all the truth all the time. Well, the government I know. Here we has go. not done that. <laughs> I mean, but but, the, but yeah, back but. before that, the choice was not to tell you. And now they can choose to tell you and it not be the truth. Well, uh, there was the Gary Powers case and the Eisenhower mm-hmm. administration. We, 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 the government has always to some extent told us what we need to know rather than what really is uh, but but part of that is considered to be national security and and uh, I understand that to some extent but but as a journalist there's um there's really a, a good uh, ethical and moral question as far as how you cover a war because mm-hmm. you know if I'm covering an election or a football game, uh, I may have an interest in who wins or loses, but I'm not going to do anything to uh, help one side or the other. And most journalists are like that. Mm-hmm. But in covering a war, if um, 
you have information that's injurious to the United States. It's considered to be a lack of patriotism, and I can understand that, to report that Mm -hmm. and uh, to make our, our soldiers be at risk. Often journalists travel with the United States in, in warfare. And so wasn't they, it Geraldo Rivero that gave up one, they, they were gave up a position of a group one time and in, in was it Afghanistan or somewhere like that. He gave up where their, their position on the air. Well, that wouldn't be a good thing. No. But, so we, even as journalists, when it comes to national security, we mm-hmm. have a different perspective and we also use the term and, when we're talking about the United States at war with another country, we use the term we. Where if I'm covering LSU, I'm an LSU graduate. I like it when LSU does well, but I'm not going to, if they beat Alabama, I'm not going to say we play or we beat Alabama. I wasn't on the field. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or they beat us. Right? I would only say that if I were actually in uniform and had pads on. But right. uh, uh, And I resent it when journalists uh, use that pronoun we. But we have a different perspective when it comes to war, and most Americans are not going to do anything to put our soldiers in harm's way. But what if uh, there was some rogue leader who was about to lead uh, a platoon on a death mission and a journalist had information about that? There are all kinds of ethical questions that come into play, and and, uh, at times we have to make tough choices, and, and it's... It's fortunately in my career, I've never been, actually I was in Gaza once and bombs were dropping, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I, I've never been in an all out war and I never had to decide whether or not, uh, something was, uh, palatable for the masses or not, or palatable for my own safety. But, um, but, um, sometimes journalists have to make that call and sometimes presidents and other leaders of countries in the United States in particular have to do that. And uh, in that case, um, I'm willing on some cases to give them the benefit of the doubt on some cases. Mm-hmm. But okay. uh, what was that song by Merle Haggard? Remember when Nixon lied to us all <laughs> on TV? <laughs> We're rolling downhill yep. like a snowball headed for hell. <laughs> you, what, would it, what was it back when a joint was a bad place to be? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are some of the historical political figures from Louisiana who you think have had a lasting impact on its political culture? Well, certainly in uh, the last century, Huey Long. Right. There's no doubt. that I was a bodyguard for one of his cronies. Really? And heard some really interesting well, stories Huey, about him. Yeah, Huey had a full life. He died at 42, mm-hmm. as did Elvis Presley mm-hmm. and Bobby Kennedy. Yep, but he did a lot in those forty-two years, and um, uh, you know, in the Great Depression, we are we're a poor state, and twenty uh, percent of all the construction in the U.S. was going on in Louisiana. So he he mm-hmm. did a lot. Uh, I think he definitely had more of an impact than anybody else. And then there was Edwin Edwards, who was governor for sixteen years. Mm-hmm. He logged 5,784 days in the governor's mansion and 3,007 days in federal prison. So he had more than 24 years of uh, state service, public housing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, he, Huey Long is an interesting figure because I often wonder if, he, you know, Louisiana has always been a little different from the other right. southern states. It's diff- It's been different from Mississippi, Arkansas, Georgia, Alabama, Florida. And I often wonder if Huey Long would have not come on the scene, would Louisiana have gone the same way culturally as those other southern southeastern states? You, do you, in your opinion, you think he really emphasized the class mm-hmm. angle on the population mm-hmm. versus I don't think it, that is as prevalent in other southern states. At least that's the impression I got growing up. Now, is yeah, that well, is that kind of a fair statement? I mean, he was well, the he, people's he, governor. He did that, but he died in 1935. And in, in the 1960 census, 25 years after his death, uh, New Orleans, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, and Miami were all about the same size. They're all in the top 10 
Mm -hmm. And New Orleans, New Orleans is down to a million metro, one one million. Baton Rouge is almost 900,000. In your lifetime, Baton Rouge will probably catch New Orleans. But New Orleans didn't grow, the other cities did. And uh, I don't think we can blame that on, on Huey Long. But maybe we can blame it on a tradition of corrupt politics to some extent. But Louisiana has issues uh, environmentally that other states don't. We're, we, it's hard for a New Orleans to expand when it's got water everywhere you go. It's not like you can just build out. And the weather, the weather is rugged. It's rugged in Houston, too. But they grew, and we didn't. And we, uh, we do have some resources that they don't have. We're the third largest energy producer in the U.S., and yet we're the second uh, poorest state. And we're losing population. I I was uh, in Atlanta over the weekend, and the top three growing cities last year in the country, in the country, were Dallas, Houston, and Atlanta. Really? And and New Orleans, of course, and Louisiana lost population. I had heard Atlanta. I didn't realize both Houston and Dallas were. They're number one and two. And and you look at the top ten. Every state is in the Sun Belt. It's either in Texas, Florida, Georgia, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Charlotte's in there. That's kind of the Sun Belt. It's a southern state. There are no states. Nashville's probably in there, too. North Nashville was not, surprisingly. Really? But over the course of time, you're right, it's been growing exponentially and now is uh, considered a, a great American city. But uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans are not growing as fast as those other states. And it used to be that we were losing congressional seats because we were growing. We just weren't growing as fast as these other states. Mm-hmm. So it's done on a proportional basis. And when you go from 1.4% of the national population where we are now, and we were at 1.8, every time you lose a, 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 a point here or there, a, a fraction of a point, um, it means losing a congressional seat. We likely will lose another one in the next census right. in 2030. And uh, we're washing away, too. Uh, if we don't do something, uh, New Orleans will be no longer in perhaps as soon as 50 years. Now, we'll probably do some things, but whether people would want to move and be a part of that, mm-hmm. uh, we're talking about an existential survival mission here. Uh, they probably would prefer, especially if they're older, um, to live in a place without these weather extremes. And we have plenty of them there. And Huey Long's not responsible for the weather. But he was, uh, I, I think, a corrupt politician to some extent. But he was, um, he was doing it. Uh, he's the politician who did it for the lower class. The he, was, he was a Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. And, and definitely the state advanced. Look at what happened to LSU. He, he made things happen. But he also he died, and uh, if he hadn't been shot on September eighth, nineteen thirty five, he probably would have been shot at some other point. Right. And uh, one of the things when we were talking nationally that concerns me more than anything else is we haven't had um, a president wounded by gunfire since Ronald Reagan. That's been forty three years, mm-hmm. and uh, I think uh, Trump or Biden uh, could could be assassinated and can you imagine the division that would cause in the country and, it'd be uh, horrible yeah it'd be absolutely it'd dead. be horrible it'd be devastating and 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 it only takes uh, one bad apple to um, to pull something like that off at least to try and of course there are attempts but usually they don't get close enough but we live in an open society and those those things can happen and what happened to huey long and john kennedy and bobby kennedy and george wallace Martin Luther King, that could that could happen to somebody today. There's no reason to believe that we're immune from that today, and it's been a long time, and it's almost inevitable it will happen. And uh, our country is already divided, so you can only imagine what would happen if something like that were to occur. But um, I, I often wonder what would have happened to Huey Long if he had lived. Uh, he was only 42. And uh, he, he might have ended up being president of the United That's States. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Donald Trump's taken a lot of Huey's uh, methods. Mm-hmm. He's he's a populist from the right. Huey mm-hmm. was a populist from the left. But but a lot of those methods have been employed. And uh, the passion that he is the savior is the same as it was with, with Huey Long. Right. 
But we were right in the middle of a depression. I mean, Huey Long was killed in 1935. He was elected governor in 1928. But Edwin Edwards was was certainly a uh, inheritor of that type of politics. Uh, he was born in 1927, the year before Huey was elected governor. And uh, he had the capacity to do things for our state with his great charisma and his um, ability to sell that I think he missed some opportunities, and uh, that's a shame. But, um, but he was a true Louisiana character, and we do have a lot of those. You mentioned others, uh, like Stoney, uh, a guy I used to interview a lot. I used to interview him just for sport. I've got a box of real to reel tapes. It was John McKithen, who brought oh, us yeah. this, oh, wow. the Superdome. And mm-hmm. he was from Columbia, Louisiana, and he's the one who brought us the Superdome. And... Um, he was uh, a guy who, in, he, in 1941, he was 23. He was uh, fresh out of LSU Law School, and he flunked his physical. But he lied to get in the war, <laughs> and he fought in Japan, and he jumped in a foxhole when his platoon was under attack, and a guy jumped on top of him named Walter Fox, and he was Walter Fox was shot in the back and killed by a Japanese soldier, and John McKithen named his son. Walter Fox McKithen, who became the Secretary of State. Mm-hmm. Wow. And he died tragically, too. But but Big John McKithen was quite a, quite a character. And, and Louisiana has elected some really smart governors. McKithen was a brilliant guy. Edwin Edwards was brilliant. John Bell Edwards was real smart. Bobby Jindal was a very smart guy. Mm-hmm. He is a very smart guy. And uh, Buddy Romer, who was, I think mm-hmm. uh, those are the five that I would put at a level way above most uh, people in our state and certainly above my level. But, but um, um, our people um, are yearning for something better than what we've had. And um, I mean, I can, I can kind of attest to that a little bit, not, not nearly in like a, in a local government aspect, but like specifically like it's something bigger than that. It's been hard to like really get involved. I, w- I want to get more involved, especially cause I know I'm, you know, in that, I'm in that demographic where a lot of the people in my age bracket and younger don't vote or don't contribute cause they, they feel like, you know, they don't, their vote doesn't matter or, you know, whatever their, their excuse may be, but it's hard sometimes. Like I feel like the only two options I have, I'm not super happy with. And it's like it's hard to get involved when I feel like it's so corrupt at times. If like it's so messy and it feels like it's not, like I feel like nothing that's going on is you know um, there to help me out or help or or to like to help me see like the a, a brighter and more positive future or anything like that. It just feels like more fighting and more division and more. So it's like it's been it's been difficult over the past few years you know, with all this stuff going out, but you know, well, uh, hopefully that will, that will change. And what comes next? We know in 2028, neither Biden nor Trump will be on the ballot. Yeah. Um, neither one, uh, well, Biden by then will be 86. If he were to lose, he would be eligible to run, but he's not going to run. We know that. And he may not be alive. Trump may not be alive, but, but it, it, we'll have, uh, a, a different Republican, a different Democrat. Right. But what kind? Will it be somebody like Trump? Yeah. Is there anybody like Trump? Right. And uh, I would imagine the Democrats will go for somebody who uh, is different and younger and than Biden. But will it be somebody uh, uh, so progressive that uh, they have no chance of winning a state like Louisiana? Because in our, in our state, we're still relatively conservative when it comes to uh, social issues. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's where John Bell Edwards, who was the only Democrat in statewide office, survived. And I think he did because even though he was, um, I think, liberal on many social issues as far as uh, bread and butter, he was conservative on guns and abortion. And, uh, and he was a West Point guy. So he, he didn't come across as a wild eyed radical. Uh, and, and he was able to win, but he won in part because he had two wounded opponents. He mm. had David Vitter the first time. Yep. And then the second time he had Eddie Rasponi, who was 70 years old and had never run for office. And Rasponi still almost beat him, mm-hmm. lost by 40,000 votes. 
and Rispone actually was a good man, but um, he had never run for office and he didn't know what he was doing. And uh, usually those who excel in politics uh, do it like everybody else because they've been there. Now, Trump is the exception, but he, uh, Trump won a close one, lost a close one when in the Electoral College, I, even though the, he touted it as a, as a um, landslide. He got over 300 electoral votes the first time, and Biden did the second time. If you take a few of those states and uh, slice and dice them, uh, really Trump won in the Electoral College by about 40,000 votes the first time and lost by about 40,000 votes the second time. So even... That's the way it is, and that's the way the game is played. I think it would be better for us to have a national vote in which every vote were the same because now Louisiana has eight electoral votes, and we have 4.7 million people. Now, Wyoming has three electoral votes and has about 600,000 people. So your vote in Wyoming counts, counts more than it does in, in Louisiana. That's right. In Louisiana, and in Louisiana, our votes count more than those people in Texas or California. The bigger state you're in, the less your vote counts. And really? I thought we had one person, one vote, and it's the only election in America that I'm aware of in which you can win and actually lose the overall vote mm-hmm. because yeah. of the electoral college. Now it creates a lot of drama. It's fun for political pontificators because you look at that map and we could have we could have great drama imagine if it is 269 to 269 or imagine if uh it wasn't florida 537 votes decides the one state that is determining who will win and um (laughs) and that's what happened in 2000 it could happen again and uh, I, i don't think that's good and it almost worked. It, it generally the, the last few times it's been Democrats who have won the overall vote and lost in the Electoral College. Clinton in 2016, Hillary Clinton and Gore in 2000. But John Kerry, if he had carried Ohio, which he almost did in in 2004, he would have won the election. And George W. Bush, he won the overall vote by three million votes. So it could could swing both ways, and uh, and that's why I don't think it'll ever be changed unless it hurts one party as much as it hurts the other. I'm curious, do you have uh, do you have any predictions or any kind of like I do with your years of for like this that, election? Or, or, yeah, just or do you, or do you do you see anything changing, anything happening, or do you have any idea, any insider knowledge that uh, that we may not have? I, I, I don't, and it, but we are getting close. Thirty weeks is. I know 30 weeks from tomorrow as we speak 210 days I I do think that uh, about 43 states are are already settled and and so that brings it down to those seven and uh, I think Trump is likely likely not that's why they're battleground states we don't know but I think he's likely to win Georgia and North Carolina and if he does win there then that means Biden has to win he has to win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, most likely to mm. win. Uh, and um, he lost, or he, uh, he didn't. Hillary Clinton lost all three of those states in 2016 narrowly, and Biden won all three narrowly in 2020. So it's going to be a close race. And I have no doubt that if uh, if Trump does not win, that he will once again claim that that there was some kind of fraud. Well, of course, and and uh, right. And there's always some fraud, but it's yet to been, be proved that there was enough fraud to overturn the election of 2020. And uh, but but that just adds to the to the division in the country. And Trump, if he's now he's an amazing guy. He is a big man. He's he doesn't he doesn't handle stress well. Is I don't know what his blood numbers are, but he <laughs> he can't be in the greatest of shape at seventy eight. But he's bo- he's got boundless energy. No yeah. doubt, he's a much more energetic guy than his opponent, Mister Biden. What if he he loses a close one? If he's hale and hearty, he'll run again. <laughs> <laughs> He'll run what, again what, what would happen? Okay, you can only do two terms. If he were to win again, could he do two no. more terms? He can only do that one term, right? If you're governor of Louisiana, you can do you it. You could do way. it again. But as, but as president of the United States. It's just two terms, right? Two terms total, right? Two terms are 10 years. Okay. So if, if somebody is put in office with less than half of the term to go, they can serve that term and then mm-hmm. win twice. But 
uh, you can only win twice. But okay. if he loses, and let's say he loses a close one and he's in reasonably good health, he's got this enormous following. And if he loses a close one, I'm sure, again, he'll he'll say, look, I should have won. So he he may run again. Wow. <laughs> he may run again at 82. And this time it would be against probably Kamala Harris. Yeah. If, if Biden wins, she'll be the front runner to get the Democratic nomination. Or and, Michelle Obama. Well, that's possible, too. That's mm-hmm. possible, although she has said she's not interested. But you know how that works. Yeah. Just like I mean, Bobby, Bobby Jindal yeah. said, you know when a candidate says oh, yeah. he or she is praying whether to run? <laughs> mm-hmm. God never says no. Yeah. God never yeah. says no. I, I prayed, and the Lord told me not to do it. The Lord always says yes, and poor Bobby Jindal, who had a great future, he got no electoral votes, zero, and no delegates, no delegates. He didn't get a nomination, obviously, but he got zero delegates. But he is younger. We only have three, by the way, we only have three living governors in Louisiana. John Bell Edwards, Bobby Jindal, and Jeff Landry. And how many living presidents we have? We got Jimmy Carter, barely. Barely. Mm. He's still alive. We got uh, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Mm -hmm. and Joe Biden. That's six. So we got six living presidents, and we've got three living governors. And um, um, Bobby Jindal is younger than both Landry or Edwards, and he's all dressed up and no place to go. He had a great future, but it didn't work out. But... He almost was elected governor in 2003. He lost to Kathleen Blanco, and if he had, he would have been 32 as governor. He would have um, gotten in, I believe, earlier than Huey. Huey won in 28. He was, born, he was 35 mm-hmm. when he was elected, but um, but Jindal almost beat him, and then he was elected when he was 36, but out at 44, and uh, it's going to be hard for him to reinvent himself in Louisiana. Maybe even come like Sam Houston and get elected governor somewhere else. And one there, governor what, of two there, states. So what? what is, I mean, kind of bringing this to Louisiana a little bit, what do you think of the election of Jeff Landry? You know, it was kind of uneventful. It looked like he, he won that thing right out, right? In the, in the, I mean, what is that saying about us? And is the Democratic Party in Louisiana pretty much dead? Is it, I mean, do, are they just kind of wandering in the wilderness right now? What's going on there? <laughs> I think it's on life support, and uh, Landry is um, probably going to be a governor for two terms, but you never know. Uh, Louisiana, since I, we, I talked about 79, when in 79, uh, Dave Treen won. He was a Republican, mm-hmm. and then in 83, Edwin Edwards won, and he was a Democrat, and then in 87, it was Buddy Romer. He was elected as a Democrat, but became a Republican. Then he leaves. It's back to the Democrat Edwards. Then, then, then to uh, Mike Foster, a Republican. To Kathleen Blanco, a Democrat. To Bobby Jindal, a Republican. To John Bell Edwards, a Democrat. To Jeff Landry, a Republican. So, we've uh, gone back and forth. But it is now a case in which uh, the Democratic Party is um, not in good shape in Louisiana, and it's become unfortunately racially polarized. We're only six white Democrats left in the Louisiana legislature, 144 members and six white Democrats. And when I first started covering the Capitol, most of the well over 120 members were white Democrats, and, but that's not the case any longer. But what we're going to see, I think, in Louisiana, we're going to have factions within the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh like we used to have in the Democratic Party. In 1987, when Edwin Edwards lost, he was challenged not only by a Republican Bob Livingston, but by fellow Democrats, Buddy Romer, Billy Tozan, Jim Brown, uh, former Congressman uh, Speedy Long. They all ran against Edwards as Democrats. And I think we may see that in the Republican Party soon. We're not there yet, but... We're either going to have a resurgence of the Democratic Party, or, or we're going to have, we're going to have Republican Republican light, mm-hmm. right. and mm-hmm. uh, and the Democratic Party, even though it doesn't hold statewide office, it controls most of the big cities because there is a Democratic majority. East Baton Rouge Parish, for example, which used to be a Republican stronghold, is now a Democratic stronghold. Uh, this parish that where I live. Uh, it went for Obama, it went for Hillary Clinton, it went for Biden, it went for Foster Campbell over John Kennedy, it went for Mary Landrew over Bill Cassidy, so it is a Democratic parish. We've had mayor after mayor uh, elected uh, since 2004, one Democrat after another, 
But the state as a whole is a Republican state, and uh, Jeff Landry, if he doesn't really mess up, I think he'll win uh, another term, but but he's doing some things. Uh, he's not resting on his laurels, shall we say. And uh, for people who say they're shocked at how uh, bold he's been, and I think this is exactly 100 days since since he was uh, since he was uh, inaugurated, he's been extremely uh, forceful in what he <laughs> wants for our state, and uh, and why not? He was elected without a runoff, and. Even though most of the people in the state didn't vote, people also make a choice not to vote. And in this case, 65% of those made a choice not to vote. But of those who did, a majority of them voted over for Jeff Landry over 15 candidates. And some of them spent a lot of money. And, yeah. and uh, they didn't do well. So I, uh, I think he deserves, as a new governor, every uh, good wish. And I think it's, it'd be good for our state if he succeeds. And uh, I don't think he's a bad man. He's just uh, he's a conservative with a capital C. And he believes that's where the state is right now. And maybe he's right. Mm. What do you think of this uh, change in the Constitution? I know that's the big talk right now. Yeah, and that one, um, it's going to be tough to pull that one off because now, this is where we're getting the first evidence of a uh, of a split in the Republican ranks. Cameron Henry, who heads the Senate, is not in accord with Landry on uh, the timeline for this. He doesn't want lawmakers to go past June 3rd. They've already been there for two special sessions, now a regular session. Landry would like to keep them there, I think, until August. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Henry says they're just worn out. Right. And, and, and another thing, making lawmakers delegates to a constitutional convention is not necessarily a good thing because lawmakers – often do things uh, because they have their eye on the next election. They want to keep winning, and sometimes they might even uh, say things and be in favor of things that they're personally not because they're representing a constituency where I think delegates to a constitutional convention should do what they believe is the right thing for the state, independent of any political interference. And, and the plan on the table right now is to have every lawmaker, a delegate to the convention, I personally think there's a better way of doing that. But uh, Jeff Landry is striking while the iron is hot. And uh, he, if, if Donald Trump wins the presidency, I think he is, if, he, if he wants to go, there would be a spot in Washington for him. Mm -hmm. And he also was a congressman, and he liked it a lot in Washington. He liked it a whole lot. He could run for the Senate in three years, two years now, two years and two and a half years against Bill Cassidy. Yep. And it looks like we'll have closed primaries, and I think Landry would be the favorite if he ran against Cassidy. So he has lots of options, but that would also partially explain why he is doing things so readily right now. He's aggressively. Not, he, he, yeah, he, 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 yeah, aggressively is the right word. He's not... He, he, he's not holding back at all. No, he's, he's, he's not, not sitting there looking at the office. He, he, is, he is very aggressive. No, he's not a general. caretaker. Mm -hmm. Now, John Bell Edwards, I think he would have been the same kind of governor, but he didn't have a supermajority in both houses, mm -hmm. uh, the House and the Senate. So Landry does. But John Bell Edwards, uh, I think, is quite possibly going to run again in, in uh, three years now. I don't know that, but I think it's a possibility. But they could also change the Constitution where he couldn't run. Mm -hmm. yeah. They could say two terms and that's, that's it. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> but At all least. these things have to be approved by the electorate, right. too. They, exactly. it just It's not a, you know, you can't do it unilaterally. And, and some of these things, you got to be careful if you go too far because uh, – on a, a lot of sacred stuff in that mm -hmm. constitution. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, a, yeah. I'm gonna tell you, I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna lie yeah, to you. And and it affects the budget, and and uh, it 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 could be good, it could be bad. And also, if you like Jeff Landry, and you say, look, let's just let him do what he wants, and let's see what happens. Well, what happens if you get a governor you don't like? You don't like exactly. Yep. Then that governor has the same power that mm -hmm. Landry has. That's oh. right. Well, there was an article, I forgot where I read it. It was one of the local papers around here saying that he's going back for the emperor of Louisiana. Well. Back back to the, the Huey P. Long days well, where he, the governor he, was the true emperor of Louisiana. It's he, like is, he, uh, he is getting a, a new nickname, Huey P. Landry. Mm -hmm. Huey P. Landry. Um, <laughs> you, you said something about Edwin Edwards. and it, what He ran for, what was it, Congress? Was it Congress or the Senate? He I ran for Congress, Congress 10 years ago. Right. And he ran in a gerrymandered district. If he had run in a 
the district that uh, they've just drawn, he probably would have won. He probably would have won, but I would have loved to have seen him, that little Cajun, doing his first filibuster and just talking oh, yeah. and talking and talking. I would have loved to have seen that. He could talk. He could talk. And uh, he, I, I was fortunate to interview him uh, many times, and actually many times in his last years. And mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I used to give speeches and still do, but when there was a hostile audience or one just not really responding, the, the line that was solid gold, I would say, Edwin Edwards is going to be here tonight, but he had to be rushed to the hospital. And, they'd, Ooh, and I'd say, he had to be present for the birth of his fourth wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> hey, he's the guy who said a man is only as old as the woman he feels. Mm-hmm. Well, he, <laughs> Among he, he, had, <laughs> he had a lot of charisma and humor, kind of like Ronald Reagan. Um, he, he, he could use humor to win over an audience. Yeah. Well, Reagan was, he was an actor and an mm-hmm. ami- amiable guy and, right. uh, and, uh, didn't appear to have malice in his heart. And mm-hmm. I don't think he did. Now, Edwin Edwards could have been a, he could have been a stand up comic. He mm-hmm. was, he, he, yeah. He was funny. He, he, he was, he was that good. And he was, he was so quick, so quick, mm-hmm. uh, when he was, acquitted in his federal trial in new orleans in 1986 they had a lot of national media there and he was governor at that time and first reporter said uh, governor what do you say to the feds who say uh, what, what do you say to those who say the feds were you were guilty as hell the feds just weren't smart enough to catch you he said they're half right <laughs> <laughs> i believe what was the, was the federal president was that stan bardwell in that well, that was Stan Bardwell in Baton Rouge, uh, but but the the guy who indicted him in New Orleans was John Volts. John Volts, John that's Volts, it. Volts, yeah. And, yeah. and Volts, uh, he got a hung jury the first time, and then they they came back, and Edwards got an acquittal the, the second time, and and he went to jail at seventy five for ten years. That was the sentence. He got out eight and a half years. He got a little bit off of his sentence, but he went to jail at seventy five and. Frank Palazzola sentenced him, and it amounted to a life sentence, and he ended up outliving Palazzola. And mm-hmm. he said, uh, they sent me away for life, and I came out with a wife. And she was <laughs> 51 years his junior. Yeah, wow. 51 years. And when he was in jail, I interviewed him shortly after he got out, and I asked him, he acknowledged that he was an atheist, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, you didn't pray when you were in prison? Uh, he said, would you? I said, yeah, I'd pray a lot <laughs> to get me out of this for God forsaken place. He goes, no, I didn't pray. So I said, well, when's the last time you prayed? He said, I prayed this morning that this would be a good interview. And obviously my prayers were not answered. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Man, so, <laughs> he was something. There will never be another like Edwin Washington Edwards, no. uh, who lived a you know, full a lot, life. A lot of times they'll say Edwards was a, and kind of the heir of Huey Long. I think, Somebody that gets forgotten is Earl Long. I, mm-hmm. I, yeah. I find it more. I mean, what do you, what do you think of Earl Long's legacy? In well, he was governor three times, and um, he died right after he would won a congressional race. He never served, but he he won in 1960. And of the last twelve governors, he's the only one I haven't interviewed. Oh, I don't wow. think I'm going to be interviewing Earl, but if he hadn't been Huey's brother, he was a character, and I think there's no doubt that he he kind of lost his mind uh, at the end, and he had a affair with Blaze Star. That's right. And, yep. And uh, he <laughs> he was from Winfield, Louisiana, as was O.K. Allen and Huey Long, uh, that small town in North Louisiana, which I think has produced more governors than New Orleans. <laughs> That's where the Louisiana Political Hall of Fame is appropriately. But but Earl was every bit the character that Huey was, and um, they weren't that far apart in age. Uh, it is interesting. Huey was born in 1893, uh, and I think Earl was born in 1895, and they were like the seventh and eighth kids. Oh, wow. I you know, know usually, mm-hmm. you know, Aren't, aren't most leaders like first yeah, born? First born, exactly. but, yeah. But yeah, it makes you wonder what was before them to cause them to be the way they mm-hmm. were. Both were brilliant guys too. There's no no question about that. But they 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 do have that. The legacy we were talking about. It's probably as much of a 
a residual uh, effect of Earl Long is Huey Long because Earl was around a lot longer, pardon the pun. And, uh, but we're talking about two brothers who dominated the Louisiana political landscape from 1928 to 1960. I know. So that's, that's 32 years and that's a long, long time. And, um, I do go by Huey's grave and I talk with him. I'm trying to get him to be the 12th governor I've interviewed but, uh, <laughs> so far. So far he hasn't answered me back, but, uh, I, I, I regret that I never, uh, never got to meet the Kingfish, but that state capital, that's, Huey Long, mm -hmm. uh, he, he affected our state largely, I think, in a positive way, but his methods were not positive. And when people compare Jeff Landry to Huey Long, he's got more power than Huey Long had. Huey Long got impeached. Mm -hmm. Jeff Landry's not going to be impeached. Right. He's got a super majority. Even if he did something really bad, he wouldn't be impeached. But, uh, but Huey, uh, he barely lasted. He barely survived. Uh, and he had to use force to stay in office. But those who live by the sword die by the often sword. die by the That's sword. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about remember uh, Kip Holden? What do you think about Kip? He was the mayor, and he was also a, a Louisiana representative for a while. He he, yeah. he had a lot to do in the state. Kip had a vision, and uh, and he was I think uh, a mayor who made things happen, and mm -hmm. uh, he he was elected three times and uh, he was part of that transformation of Baton Rouge from a, from a red city to a blue city. And the second time he was elected and talk about the success he had in his first term, the second time he carried every precinct, mm -hmm. every precinct. Mm -hmm. So he was one of those black politicians who transcended race. And I remember the Bayou Country Superfest that he started. He, uh, he invited me to go with him once, and I, I did. And I uh, sat in his suite and uh, next to Sean Connery's son, by the way, okay. Jason Connery. Kip hobnobbed with uh, yeah. a lot of famous people. Uh -huh. but, but I was amazed because we went outside, and here's this black liberal Democrat and he's being embraced by all these guys in cowboy hats who aren't black. And it's like they all want to have their photo taken with Melvin Kip Holden. And unfortunately, he is now he's fighting dementia. Yes, he is. Right. And, uh, and the last time I went and saw him, he didn't recognize me. I was actually so on his you knew campaign him. staff you knew for a while. Him. You yes. knew him and, and liked him, I'm sure. Oh, I loved him. But he's, uh, he's not an old man. He's born in 1952. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's 70... Uh, one years old he's fighting which hard. means um mm -hmm. he is he is more than a dec. well he's a decade younger than biden mm -hmm. and he's seven years younger than trump <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he and the poor man that shows right. you yeah. right. it's scary because it happened fast mm -hmm. i really didn't see any real signs of that when he was mayor and he wasn't mayor that long ago he's mayor mm -hmm. into 2016 yep. yep but he um he came from nothing too i mean nothing he his mother uh he did shows with me and talked about how his mother at time dated the most notorious drug dealer in the state mm -hmm. and uh and there were shootouts at his house and uh, it was a case in which it was a miraculous uh thing that he survived and lived but he um he's fighting hard to stay alive and um he was a study in resilience started as a journalist by the yeah. way Yep. As did Sharon Weston Broom. Why do you think uh, when he ran for governor, why do you think there was such opposition? He was so popular. For a lieutenant governor? Yeah, yeah that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, lieutenant well, you governor. know, he does hold the record uh, for a um, minority candidate as mm -hmm. far as statewide votes. Mm -hmm. um, he got right at 46% of the votes against mm -hmm. Billy Nungesser. So he um he ran a very good race and he he would have been elected in 2015 if he mm -hmm. had won and and you can imagine this battle he's fighting probably would have been while he was lieutenant governor yeah. right. uh, yep. but but he uh, right now i think in order for a black person to win in louisiana state why they'd have to be a republican mm -hmm. i don't think they can win as a, a democrat right now but but things change, and cycles come and go, and uh, I, I've told uh, people who are Democrats who are fearful of a, of a Trump comeback that if Trump wins, it's just the nature of American politics, if Trump wins this year, 
That means in 2026, the Democrats will get a huge wave in the midterm elections and then likely will win the presidency in 2028, where if Biden wins, Republicans will probably get the wave in 2026 and the next president will be a Republican. Mm -hmm. And, but Trump is one of those people that those who dislike him, uh, dislike him so intensely that we just can't take that chance, Jim. We just can't take that Mm -hmm. chance. Well, the country has survived worse. We did survive a civil war, but now the, uh, the weaponry is such that we could be vaporized all of us on the planet in a day. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's some concern by many that Trump is not stable. And, uh, I I don't know that that's the case, but, and I do think that if uh, any president, whether it's Trump, Biden, or somebody else tried to do something really crazy, we have safeguards in place where they couldn't pull it off, but I'm not sure that's true in other places. And now some of these countries do have nuclear capacity, which could be Mm -hmm. devastating. Yes. Imagine what the Dow Jones industrial average would do if a nuclear weapon were used anywhere in the world. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And for those who think stop, just, just one, just, just, one, just, one. just one, just yeah. one. And it's like, wait and see what happens. And mm-hmm. then if there's a response, it's over. Look out. It's all, you, over. you know, that that's so funny that you talk about nuclear war and Trump. And because I recall when Reagan was running the talk at the time, Reagan was going to start world war three. Well, that and was, I'm he hearing was, he was, kind of the same kind of, but with Trump, different. Trump was the only president in the, that I just in find the near past that didn't get us into a war. Right. I, I find you it know. funny that the same kind of talk is about, I remember yeah. during Reagan, oh, Reagan at, you know, the SDI and Star Wars and all that mm-hmm. stuff was going on. He was going to get us in World War Three. And I'm, I'm you hear the same thing mm-hmm. with Trump. And well, it's it's just funny. Well, everybody how I was find scared it. of Reagan because they didn't know what he was going to do because he was a Democrat turned Republican. Donald Trump is a Democrat <laughs> returned Republican, and they're scared <laughs> of what he's going to do, mm-hmm. and because you really don't know. Well. Yeah. Well, uh, it, that was 1980 when Reagan was elected, mm-hmm. and he he was a he talked tough, uh, but sometimes talking tough helps. Uh, well, they were, the day he took office, what happened? Well, the hostages were they released, released every hostage but, and said, "Please, here you guys, you know, don't but, kill us but, all," but, you know. But um, the think about it in 1980, we were 35 years removed from the U.S. using nuclear weapons in Japan. And now we're 44 years removed from 1980. So we, I think then there was a real concern that it wasn't a question of uh, if, but when nuclear weapons would mm. be used. And there have been some close calls. And, and Reagan was one of those people who, um, he had an exotic background, as did Jimmy Carter for that mm-hmm. matter. You know, Carter was a peanut farmer and he one-term governor of Georgia, became president. And his lack of experience showed and and Reagan was uh, an actor, two term governor of California. And, uh, and he is remembered uh, as a a, a better than average president as is Bill Clinton, by the way, who uh, was hated by the Republicans. But now in retrospect, Clinton seems like a moderate. Imagine today if uh, a president were to propose what Clinton did, and it probably cost the Democrats the 94 midterms when the don't ask, don't tell, Mm -hmm. which was considered uh, to be heresy to have gays in the military, and Clinton proposed it. But today, if a president were to propose exactly the same thing, they would be considered a homophobe. Mm -hmm. And that shows you how times Times change. change. It's interesting, too, that you brought up the fact that, like, you know, we're so far removed from that first nuclear attack on Japan that like, I'm starting to think about it. I was like, am I, am I mistaken that like, I know there's been some pretty big things that have happened over the ha- the past handful of years, but I remember the, f- like the last, like, like terror, like the, like the last thing that I was like scared of as far as war was the twin towers in 21, I mean, in 01. Mm-hmm. And that was over, over 20 years ago. And like, and now there's people that are, you know, Again, like I said, voting age, old enough now that weren't around <laughs> you during were that time. seven years old, then, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, I, rem- I, I, I couldn't comprehend what was happening, but it was a big deal to my parents. It was a big deal to the community I was a part of. It was like, it was a, it impacted, again, even though my child brain couldn't understand what was going on, it was like the world around me was changing in such a way where everyone was scared about it. 
And well, I, don't, I don't I don't remember anything in recent years that has been quite as um, that was pivotal, unusual in that the United States was attacked that day, but it was done uh, presumably by some rogue elements uh, not affiliated with an official government. But all of those guys were from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And yet we didn't go to war with we, the United States, didn't go to war with Saudi Arabia. We went to war with Iraq and Saddam Hussein, who was no saying he had nothing to do with 9-11, but right. we went to war as a country against him. And uh, we, at the same time, the Saudi prince was visiting George Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, and they were the ones. Those 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 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Some of them were trained here in Louisiana. They may have been they on the have. on the planes. Yep, they got and, their pilot training in and, Louisiana, and that was a crazy, crazy thing to do. Uh, who would who would do something like that because they're giving their life, but. I do remember they were called cowards, and and no, they're crazy. But when somebody flies a plane into a building, I don't right. think they're a coward; they're crazy, and, yeah. uh, and they're very committed <laughs> to their cause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're laughing, but we're laughing to keep from crying right. because, my God, uh, that was that was a horrible day, and um, but our country united on that one. Uh, but that one, that's uh, that, that, talk about TV. Mm-hmm. That that was a visual searing memory that I can still see. And I was in Panama years. City, and I was putting on a, a scuba suit. I was getting ready to go cool. scuba diving, and I turned the TV on, and the first tower was burning. And I had some about eight friends with me, and I said, "Wow, they just they just redid the fire suppression system on these towers. How can it be burning?" And I literally watched the second plane hit. And I scream out to everybody, get up. The world just changed. Yeah. That was did. just, I can remember it like it was yeah. yesterday. Well, and then they hit the Pentagon. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that one that crashed in Pennsylvania was headed for the Capitol. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to, I'm telling you, if that would have been, if mm-hmm. that would have happened. Well, and think of those guys uh, uh, on that plane uh, that went down in Pennsylvania who. Stopped that. They, they, they gave their lives to try sure. to stop it. But if they hadn't, it would have just gone right into the. They were, was it the cap? Was it the, the capital, capital or, or the White House? White House? I'm trying to remember. Well, I think it was the Capitol. Yeah, it was the Capitol. But uh, either one. Yeah, but it it was um, a horrible day, um, and I, if that's what it takes to unite the country, that's a terrible way to do it. But it happened then. But now I'm not even sure it would do it. Uh, I think people would be blaming one side or the other saying that they were responsible for it and um it would be a fear attack and considering the timing if it uh-huh. happened in the next month or so well, it would just sure. be another fear tactic well, for sure. the election like it you said would. blaming somebody and, else and then neither party has a monopoly on virtue no Pe- people are people and uh 100 percent agree and with now, that statement. and now we uh, we know that uh misinformation wins elections and and sometimes we're willing to basically sell our souls to try to get power because we presume if we have power we can do good things but ultimately if you do bad things to try to do good things that there's a disconnect there and Mm -hmm. karma karma (laughs) karma always catches us at some point Mm -hmm. yes it does anything else you guys want to (laughs) touch on or was that that's that's a a good closing point i guess yeah yeah. Wow. Man, we really appreciate you coming well, out. You. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for coming. And if you ever it. want to come back, please let us know. This <laughs> oh, has been you, this has been interesting and, and Ian and Jason, thank you. Having somebody that's so well versed in this political scene, especially in Louisiana and the country. This has been fascinating. Well, thank and you. I have 30 more questions. I no, just no, didn't no. have time <laughs> to get to them. Um, so if you ever want to come back, yeah. please come on back. You're part of the do. Retrospect family mm-hmm. now and if there's something you, you want to say, you're welcome to use our platform to do it. And 
as long as it's not ugly. We don't do ugly well, here. We do serious and we, we, and we, we do, do lighthearted, but we don't. We just don't do ugly. And this is like a super secret uh, hideaway. I, I feel like uh, you're Bruce Wayne. <laughs> 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 or bad cave. Yeah. The bad cave. Huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you know, with the Stony for President hashtag, I'm getting ready to start my campaign now. So <laughs> Bruce Wayne in his stately manner. That's yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I know, I know this is probably going to be, this is a big episode that I feel like people are going to want to, ask questions about or talk about probably so um if you have some more short form responses you want to give to us we have a facebook page forward slash retrospect pod where you can go ahead and give us those we also have an email address get offended together at gmail.com where you can give us those long form responses because i know you guys probably will have some and y'all do we've gotten a couple yeah, of four pagers so <laughs> <laughs> we have a very intellectual well, please following keep me posted so. yeah yes. well, i can tell you uh, you go places others won't and others don't so and congrats on your success and thank you glad to be part of your show awesome but well with all that being said thank you as much for listening and until next week bye-bye goodbye everyone god bless god bless you good night hey thank you for hanging out with us for this this very interesting conversation today you are the best peace peace